Thank you very much, Guillermo. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks to the Per Jacobson Foundation for making this possible. And uh, I'm glad that so many of you are here with, in the age of Zoom, you never know whether there'll be a real live audience. So thank you for being here. Um, so um, I think uh, 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 Guillermo has already talked about um, Per Jacobson. Uh, he played a vital role in strengthening the rules-based system that encouraged international cooperation and globalization at a time when, like today, trust was in very short supply. And while climate change was not a burning issue at that time, I think the theme of my talk today would be very much to his liking. So uh, with that, let me get into my talk today. Uh, let's see, that's Per Jacobson for you. Um, so we have broad agreement with a few holdouts that, uh, you know, we have an existential threat with climate change. We are already behind uh, and ha likely have lost the battle to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees centigrade. Now we are saying maybe we can keep it below two over the pre-industrial levels of temperatures. Now, certainly there seems to be more desire to act. Of course, we're still reshuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic at this point. At some point, we will act for sure, given the buildup in, uh, in at least purpose. But at the same time, we seem much less worried about the ongoing deglobalization, which is happening through a mix of old fashioned protectionism and emerging new geopolitical concerns. And often people couch this as, you know, we need to be pragmatic. We need to worry about what works and not be idealistic about a globalized world. And by globalized, I mean a world which has strong trade in goods and services, uh, a cross-border flow of capital, technology, and information, and some migration of people. Now, this is a picture of trade. Uh, you've seen this picture before. Even before the pandemic, trade was coming down since the global financial crisis. If you look at protectionist measures, you will see a big ramp up in protectionist measures during the pandemic relative to liberalizing measures. So people say, well, let's put all our capital on climate change. That's the real problem. And for sure, it is the real problem. But I would argue that um, we do need globalization also because deglobalization will make climate action much more difficult. And that's why the title of the talk, Climate Action and Continued Globalization are joined at the hip. So what I want to talk about today very quickly, given uh, time, is why climate action needs globalization. Let me try and make that point to you. Some of you will be convinced um, it's the unconvinced that I need, I need to focus on. Why? Uh, but even after I make that point, we have to ask, why is there a pushback on globalization? Why is globalization unpopular? And then lastly, can we sort of meld the actions that we need to take on climate to fit in with an environment where we respect people's concerns about globalization? Can we do the two together in a much more respectful way than we have done so far? So let me talk about climate action first. I mean, think about the three elements of climate action. First, mitigation, which is reducing emissions. Second, adaptation, which is if we aren't able to reduce emissions enough to prevent serious climate change, and almost surely that is the case, then countries have to adapt, possibly by moving away from certain kinds of activities, possibly by moving away from certain kinds of regions. But if you fail on both mitigation and adaptation, what is left is migration. And already people are talking of enormous numbers of people who will have to migrate from South Asia, who will have to migrate from Sub-Saharan Africa into the less climate affected North. If you think about it historically, migration has always been the solution to climate change in this world. 
It happened 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, but it's always been the solution. Today, it's much less of a solution because we have political borders. And therefore, we have to work much harder on the first two, which is mitigation and adaptation, keeping in mind that ultimately, if we fail on all those, the only solution will be mass migration. So let's talk about mitigation. Uh, why that needs global action? Well, clearly we need a global agreement on mitigation. We're not anywhere close to such a kind of agreement. And if you think about the basics of negotiation theory, the more bargaining chips each side has, the easier it is to make a deal. Global flows of any kind, whether it's investment, capital, financing, or trade, offers a variety of chips. Here's a technology transfer in, a, a, in, in exchange for more emission cuts. Here's easier financing if you promise to cut down on coal. Those are the kinds of bargains we need. In a more isolated world, those bargains become harder. That's the obvious point. Less obvious, dialogue and exchange increases information and reduces misunderstanding. How much do we know about North Korea? Nothing, because we don't have that much exchange. We do need information. When we have global agreements, we need information for monitoring. Monitoring people's climate actions will be an enormous undertaking. And that will require open societies where you can actually check on factories. How do we get that if we isolate each other? Now, I do note that today we're talking about the dangers of being dependent on each other, right? Uh, Germany can point to the dangers of dependence on Russia. Uh, buying gas and being totally dependent on it is a problem. That is indeed true. You don't want total dependence. It's equally true you don't want total isolation like North, North Korea. What you want is a certain amount of interdependence with flexibility. The flexibility to enhance ties if you want to reward the relationship, the flexibility to reduce ties if you want to reduce the relationship. And a variety of relationships so that you're not dependent on only one friend that you can essentially coexist in a globalized world where everybody doesn't think or behave like you. So I would argue that aspect of mitigation needs continued globalization. Think next about the implementation of uh, globalization. We need enormous quantities of production of new climate-friendly capital stock. Uh, we need significant amounts of investment and huge quantities of financing, and of course, innovation. Think, for example, of batteries. Uh, we already have capacity constraints on battery manufacturing. Some of the biggest elements in battery manufacturing, lithium, nickel, cobalt, rare earths, these are not found in friendly places in the, in the world. They're found in places which are more remote. They're refined in places that may not be the friendliest to you at this point. I mean, think about uh, uh, the mining of many of these. A lot of it gets done in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a country which is, to some extent, uh, conflict-ridden in parts. And of course, much of it is refined in China and Russia. And so how much would global battery production be constrained, even hit, if the sourcing for these commodities could only be domestic or from some friendly neighboring country. Of course, people will say, we can make those investments. We need to make those investments. Obviously, we do. But think about making all those investments in addition to all the new investments we need to make in order to combat climate change. Wouldn't it be easier if we kept some modicum of global ties so that these global supply chains could survive. Put differently, deep globalization will increase our costs of any kind of climate action. The threat of deglobalization through friend shoring, after all, who's a friend? Friend today may not be a friend tomorrow. If you need to make long-term investments, the threat of deglobalization, the threat of sanctions limits investments seriously. And as a result, that investment is not going to be made, especially in poor developing countries where government stability cannot be taken for granted. And as a result, what we will have 
is much less cross-border investment if that happens. Think next about livelihoods. Uh, agriculture is going to be seriously impacted. You just have to look at Pakistan to see crops underwater for three months. How are those farmers going to survive another one of those events? The buffers that people have in poor countries is very, very limited. It doesn't allow you to survive. And the government doesn't have the resources. As we know, the government is talking to the IMF. It doesn't have the resources to help its people survive these climatic effects. So the point here is that there will be tremendous amounts of investment and uh, financing required to enable people to adapt in agriculture itself, to new kinds of crops, to irrigation, to um, you know, technologies that allow less dependence on the climate. Uh, a colleague of mine, Rodney Ramcharan, and I did a study of uh, the te great Texas drought in the 1950s. Uh, that was a drought that hit um, Midwest, the middle part of the United States, um, and lasted for about eight years. And what we found was that communities which were richer and communities which had access to financing could invest more in technologies like tractors and irrigation, had higher pro productivity, and most important for the sequence I'm talking about, had much less out-migration during that period than communities which were poorer, which didn't have access to financing. The broader point is climate adaptation will require financing for poor countries, much of it will be from outside. And again, deglobalization prevents investment because we don't know what's going to happen, prevents financing. And of course, many will have to move out of agriculture. If you don't want them to move country, you want them to move to more productive areas within the economy, which means manufacturing, which means services. And today, the single most important way out of agriculture into manufacturing and services is, of course, export-led growth. And it'll become even more important because the stable source of demand will be in the less climate-affected north than the climate-affected south. So if you want those countries to move out and to have sensible livelihoods other than agriculture, you have to keep the globalization lifeline open. Otherwise, they simply cannot climb out of poverty. And the only thing they will do is head north in, uh, in other ways. So um, that's as far as uh, livelihoods go. We also need, we have all this talk about supply chains becoming more fragile, have to be res resilient to climate risk. Well, think about the best way to render a supply chain immune to climate risk. It is geographic diversification. Don't put all your supplies in one country. So the answer is not French shoring. The answer is not home shoring or near shoring. The answer is global diversification so that you can raise production in other parts of the world when some parts of the world are climate affected. One example of this geographic diversification, the merits of it, comes from our reaction to the pandemic. Remember, in spring of 2020, the one country that was unaffected by the pandemic was China. And China could ramp up production when the rest of the world was shutting down, could ramp up production of face masks. It increased the production from 10 million masks per day in March 2020 to 100 million by May 2020. In the spring of 2020, it exported more than three times the number of masks that had been made in the entire world in 2019. That is the benefit of globalization. There's some place which is unaffected, which can ramp up production when the rest of the world is affected. Of course, China's making a mistake now by not taking the vaccines that were developed in the West to vaccinate its population and is suffering from its protectionism. Again, another example why globalization makes sense. Now, of course, markets also. Uh, it's not just supply chains, it's markets. The most resilient markets are global markets. They're the ones that are going to, are going to be least affected by some kind of small-term supply shock here or there. Think about what's happening in Europe. What's the market that's not resilient? The market for gas, because that's a narrow market. What's the market that's much more resilient? The market for oil, because that's a global market and uh, Europe can tap into that. You can make the same kind of example for food, 
trying to make it local, trying to make it regional is a losing game there. Having a global market is the way to make it more resilient to short-term supply shocks. Um, let me turn finally to migration. Remember, mitigation, if it doesn't work, adaptation, if it doesn't work, uh, migration. Canada, Greenland, Siberia, large empty places in the world will become much more attractive to inhabit as we get uh, global warming. Now, if we have uncoordinated migration as it has been so far, we're going to have a lot of pushback. Climate refugees will move to the richest welcoming country until that rich welcoming country becomes welcoming no more because it's overwhelmed by people coming there. And this will result in much more hostility. It will be a poor way of, of doing migration. What we need is much more coordination in migration. We know where the climate refugees will start coming from. We need to start paying attention. What kinds of skills do they have? What kind of skills do they need? What kind of places are they going to be most acceptable? And I want to argue that there's a demand in rich aging countries for people, but people of the quote unquote right kind, people who can come in and provide uh, sort of contributions to the labor force, etc. Why not start that market now in preparation for the climate refugees that will come 20 years, 30 years from now? Create a global market in people to serve the aging Germanys of the world, to serve the aging South Koreas of the world, to serve the aging China of the world, and start creating some self-interest to getting people from outside to keep your economy going. Down the line, you are prepared for a market which will be necessitated. You can't erect border walls to keep out uh, climate refugees. The, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, of uh, horrible uh, future they will have itself will create a moral compulsion to, to, to lower those walls. But over and above that, they're not going to stay outside. They will find every which way to scale the walls. So this sense that somehow we will manage, we, we, we weren't going to be mildly affected, but we'll keep out the rest of the world which is severely affected, that's a pipe dream. It's not going to happen. And so we should start preparing for it. I can see people smiling when I talk about a global labor market. It is our future. We have to keep in mind that's going to happen. Yes, we have parties in every country which say no immigrants, etc., etc. That's the reaction right now. But we have to imagine a world not now, 20 years from now. But again, I want to say migration is the last resort. Let's try and do mitigation and adaptation in a serious way before knowing the consequences if we can't do it. So let's go to why globalization is unpopular and uh, then let me try and give you some, a few ideas on how we can do climate action um, without uh, sort of violating some of these rules. So one of the reasons globalization is unpopular is because we have a lot of global rules in order to create a uniform global integrated market. And of course, people cry that this violates democracy. Think about the European Union. Um, Brexit was a, a cry to take back control. Why? There was a sense that Brussels was imposing a huge amount of rules, including on migration, which, uh, you know, the people in, in the UK didn't actually like. In fact, some of it was angst directed at Brussels, some of it was angst directed at London. London is too big and too controlling in the UK, which is why the Conservative Party came back with leveling up and so on. But uniform global rules diminish democracy. That's one concern ag uh, against globalization. I'm, of course, acknowledging already that globalization creates winners and losers, and we've done an awful job in helping the losers. We need to do a better job. Some countries do it well. Uh, the Scandinavian countries, for example, we need to do a better job everywhere. But apart from that, there is this very real concern that it diminishes democracy. Uh, it also increases inequality because if the losers aren't helped and they stay in some parts of the country, in, in the US it's the semi-urban areas, their communities decline. And interestingly, that inequality becomes much more entrenched than in the past because today you need good skills to be able to take part 
in the global uh, labor market. And if you have this problem that your schools are not good because there's no economic activity, the, the local neighborhood is played, plagued with drugs, with crime, you're not going to come out of that and have any chance in the comparative global world. So globalization has also increased inequality by killing the small town manufacturing while enhancing the quality of big town services. It's not only that today work is very differentiated, work will be very differentiated for your children because your children will grow up in these small towns which don't have adequate services versus the people who are growing up in Boston and Washington. The third, of course, is globalization relied on Pax Americana, which is, you know, the Soviet Union during its time was out of this globalized world. Today we have a world where, you know, one of the biggest sort of uh, uh, globalizers is China, which is inside this world. And therefore, we have to think about what the future will look like with, uh, you know, a stri two strategic rivals within the globalized world. So I'm going to talk about four things in the remaining six minutes that I have uh, and, and uh, try and do this relatively fast. Five uh, ways to reduce uncertainty and to keep minimum flows and dialogue going. What I worry about tremendously is we break up into regional blocks that don't talk to each other and where people have to choose an East Asian bloc, a North American bloc, and maybe a European bloc in the middle. But countries in the South, um, the South Asia's, the uh, Africa's have to choose. Do I belong to the Chinese bloc, the East Asian bloc? Do I belong to the uh, North American bloc? We need the world to remain connected so that a minimum level of dialogue flows, investment takes place. And I would argue to do this, let's do a few things. Follow subsidiarity. Let's not impose too many decisions from the center. Let's do the minimum that is required so that there is a sense of democracy, of local control over many decisions. Second, Let's try and keep the minimum flowing. Let's not try now to impose rules on, you know, uh, detailed trade agreements. Let's at least keep the world from stopping all these activities which are already going. Some minimum level of trade and investment, let's make sure that is protected. Third, let's look for new wins. I'm very firmly a believer in the bicycle theory of reform. If you stop, you fall off. You need to keep going. What is the new area which we haven't reformed services. Let's find ways to liberalize services to move forward. At the very least, it'll make the opponents of globalization go attack that, not the existing manufacturing. At the very best, it will create all sorts of new opportunities for us. And, and fourth, which is, goes without saying, reform multilateral institutions, I'll refer you to a very good report uh, that Tharman shared uh, by the eminent persons group. There's lots of details there. So let me talk about the first three and skip the fourth. What is subsidiarity? Subsidiarity is decisions should be taken at the lowest level at which it can be taken. Okay, so you push it down at the lowest level at which it can be efficiently taken. Let me give you an example and, and uh, offer a thought on that. We're talking about a global carbon tax. We need a global carbon tax and it makes sense. All economists say it makes sense, but it's a one size fits all solution. It's impossible politically in the US today to do a, uh, a carbon tax. It's also unfair. Why does Tanzania have to implement a global, global carbon tax at the same level as, as the United States when Tanzania emits 0.2 tons per capita of carbon while the US emits 16 tons? So fairness also comes in. So can we do better? And here's a scheme that is fair and can be decentralized. So the world per capita emissions is 4.6 tons per capita. Let the over emitters, those who are above the average, pay into a global fund. Let the under emitters like Tanzania receive. So the US, which is an over emitter, would pay 16, which is its average, minus 4.6, which is the global average. That's the excess that it does. Times 325 million US people, times what I call the global carbon incentive. Let's set that at $10 per ton. Think of that as you know, equivalent to a global carbon tax. If that is the case, the US would pay 38 billion into this fund. And when you do the math, it turns out globally, the fund would get about 100 billion. Why does that number res resonate in your years? 
that is a number that rich countries promised to pay poor countries to help them deal with climate change. Tanzania, an under-emitter, would receive around 2.4 billion by the same calculation. Completely self-financing mechanism. But what is important is, aside from incorporating fairness, which is the rich emitting countries paying to the fund, the poor developing countries receive, and we do the 100 billion in financing, which can then be leveraged by private sector financing. Let's say nine to one leverage, that's not in, in, unthinkable. Nine to one leverage would get you close to a trillion a year. That's the kind of financing that starts making sense for the climate action we need, okay? So that's one, fairness is incorporated. Two, it's common incentives. What is nice about this is Tanzania has no incentive to increase emissions because it loses out on what it gets. In the same way as the US also wants to reduce emissions because that would reduce the amount it pays into the fund. Everybody has the same incentive. 10 seem, may seem low, over time it can be raised. But well, let's start with 10. It's decentralized. So Tanzania may say, look, I can't operate a carbon tax in my country. What I can do is ban coal. We will ban all coal emissions. That may be easier in, in Tanzania. Similarly, the US may say, no carbon tax, our people will not stand for it. Let us do instead uh, incentives, as they have done with the Inflation Reduction Bill. Different strokes for different folk. All you need to do is make your payments at the national level. What you do domestically is your choice. But of course, the incentive is there to reduce emissions for everyone. And finally, why would the US pay? Well, the US is committed to already making those 100 billion in, in payments. But interestingly, this allocates responsibility to other countries. One of the biggest problems of the 1992 Rio Agreement uh, what, what was it, uh, uh, common but differentiated responsibility, is nobody defined what differentiated was. So in effect, nobody has any responsibility. What we need is a system of allocating property rights in emissions. This does it. It tells you we have a common budget. If you're eating into the budget, you pay. And you pay until you stop eating into the budget. Um, so less is more. Let me end with this. Uh, um, actually, let me uh, go quickly through this. Um, can we, in this world of sanctions happening left, right, and center, preserve some global interaction? Can we keep some uh, trade going in perhaps essentials, food, medicines, energy? These are things that countries need to, to survive. They're not necessarily strategic. Of course, we're making strategic use of energy trade now. But there's a reason to ban that strategic use of trade. So can we put some shield around these activities, including on activities required for climate action? If we shield those from any kind of sanction, that does leave, leave chips, that does leave drones, all those things can be sanctioned. But let us preserve a certain amount of trade and investment by saying, if you violate this, and start putting constraints on this, you will earn the wrath of the nations, uh, the WTO rules will be violated. Can we form some basic rules of this kind? That certain amounts of trade and investment on critical commodities that are good for ordinary people be protected from sanctioning regimes unless we're in open war. That would keep a certain amount of globalization open. Let me mention that in this age of cynicism, it's easy to say, no, that won't happen. Well, think about what the US did in June, on June 10th, 1963. President Kennedy, in the midst of the Cold War, announced a total ban on nuclear tests by the United States. And in justifying his decision, remember, this was after the Bay of Pigs, this was when uh, the US was locked in a Cold War. He urged Americans not to see only a distorted and desperate view of the other side, not to see conflict as inevitable, accommodation as impossible, and communication as nothing more than an exchange of threats. I think that's worth remembering at this time. We don't need to go down this, this rabbit hole of fighting. Um, we can, you know, certainly I'm saying don't be overly trustful, but there is a me middle ground whereby you can preserve a certain amount of globalization while taking the necessary actions to protect yourself. And um, let me end with services. I would say 
um, if we want new ground for reform, services would be the right place to go. Uh, because liberalizing manufacturing further, we, they're diminishing returns. It's already pretty liberalized. And of course, there's a lot of political opposition to liberalizing manufacturing. But trade in services has not been liberalized even within many countries. I know the IMF keeps telling different countries, you need to liberalize services. If we took that as an objective, it would have so many positive effects. First, it's a big share of GDP in industrial countries. New technology allows us to provide services at a distance. You don't need to migrate to provide telemedicine services in other countries. Tele-education, um, entertainment, everybody listens to Korean pop, can we do more of that? Um, but more of these services produced at a distance um, can do two things. One, it provides that livelihood at a distance, but it also reduces inequality one of the biggest sources of inequality is spread between high quality services and manufacturing in industrial countries. If we liberalize services, it makes them more affordable for that worker that he can now find a doctor in finite time and that doctor is affordable. That's a good thing for industrial country societies as well as for emerging markets. For the climate, it's very beneficial because it's, many of these services are weightless, have low climate impact. Think about the damage done to the world if India followed China's export-led growth path on manufacturing. It's impossible. But think about India following a different path, a service-led export path. Possible India already exposed 250 billion in services, but that could lift India out of, middle, uh, of low income status very quickly without the damage to the world economy that would otherwise arise. So let me emphasize that we need liberalization services ranging from you know, qualifications. We have too many qualifications within every industrial country. Even within the US, if you're a doctor in Massachusetts, you cannot practice in California. We need to break those barriers down, have equivalence exams. If you think there's a different kind of medicine here, pass this exam. But make those exams widely available across the world so everybody can sit for those exams and be able to provide those services at a distance, whether it's in law, in medicine. There are other examples. Um, Guillermo's successor as finance minister, I think successor, Augustine Carstens, used to say how much Mexican medical hospitals could benefit if the US would pay Medicare and Medicaid for services delivered by, by Mexico. National insurance doesn't pay outside borders. Why? If it's cheaper, if it's more readily available, why can't national insurance pay for services delivered from outside? Now, all this requires, obviously, an expansion of imagination. You have to say, no, no, you can't easily say, this is not possible, not politically possible. We have to make it possible. We have to make it possible thinking about the alternatives if we don't. Let me, let me end. Uh, uh, I mean, the point about multilateral services was a very obvious one, which is, as always, we've said this many times, reform is needed. But I think the biggest point in this world is it has to play an honest broker. It has to play an honest broker between warring parties. It's no longer driven by one hegemon. There are multiple polarities in this world. Therefore, multilateral institutions not only have to be honest broker, they also have to create the agenda because no longer is one party creating an agenda which is credible to the other parties. It is better that independent multilateral uh, institutions play that role. So let me conclude by saying, so much needs to be done on climate. We haven't even got to base one. But we cannot afford simultaneously to deglobalize. We cannot say we need political capital. Um, globalization is an elite project as is, as is climate action. So let's dump uh, globalization and focus on climate action. We need to spend capital on both. I want to end by saying, look, there's a larger truth. As we're being cynical, that's a larger truth that our youth tell us. There is no planet B, right? They keep saying that in the protests. And so let's get to some simple words. And I want to uh, repeat the words of Rodney King. Those of you who are a little older may remember who he was. He was the gentleman who was beaten up by the police in 1992, precipitating the Los Angeles riots.
But he said something in, in a press conference, which was very moving. Please, we can get along here. We can all get along. I mean, we're stuck here for a while. Let's try to work it out. So as we embark on a battle against climate degradation, which may determine the nature of our existence, we have to preserve that minimum cooperation. We have to get along. Even while hoping as we get along, we learn to like each other a little better and do far more. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sagu, for uh, this very um, important uh, lecture. You have made a, a fantastic journey uh, from uh, finance to social philosophy. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> you, you've you know, touched in the intersection of uh, two of the most pressing uh, you know, global issues in our times, which is uh, climate change and globalization. You point out to the contradiction of politicians who are on the one hand exposing the need, you know, uh, to take climate action, particularly in the wake of all the horrible things that we have seen in cl climate related events this year, you mentioned some. And at the same time, you know, they're espousing protectionist policies. So, um, I think that the taxonomy that you use uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> mitigation, adaptation, and then ultimately the migration is, is very useful framework. Yeah? And let me just be very quick uh, and, and uh, provide an illustration of the difficulties to get any sort of agreement and arrangement on, on migration. And we, we should not look further than the southern border of Mexico. Uh, of course, the, the busing of Venezuelans uh, from Texas and Florida to the northern, to the democratic parts of the U.S. has gotten a lot of attention. But migration from Central America, from climate-related issues, has been going on for years. Of course, it's difficult to disentangle, you know, uh, this from political uh, and security issues. But this is something that's been happening. And yet, uh, there is no possibility in the horizon, given the uh, deep divisions in this country, that you have a coherent policy on migration. And as Neil Ferguson was pointing out in our last minute, uh, legal migration into the U.S. has practically disappeared. I mean, it's very, very low levels. Huh? And yet, you have a, a huge amount of people that are in need to work and, and you know, they could be useful here in in the US. But the, the, the issues are even more entangled because this is, you know, the, obviously the traffic of people are <clears throat> are done by the same gangs who are doing uh, trafficking in drugs. And the US has this opium pandemic. Uh, and yet uh, there's not even agreement on, on something as easy as arm, arming uh, all the cartels. I mean, if you cross the border, you can get from automatic weapons to rocket launchers, you know. So, uh, on the one hand, the U.S. is arming the drug gangs, and it's also impeding a ration, anything rational in terms of migration. Now, just an example of this. But let me, uh, I don't know if you want to comment briefly on this, and uh, let me uh, open it to the floor. No, I, I, I just want to say you're exactly right. And it tells us how far we have to go, right? Yeah. That we aren't even able, you know, the dreamers in this country, we aren't even able to agree on what we do with them. Yeah. Forget the press from the southern border. But what I want to emphasize is that press is not going to get easier. It gets harder. And it is high time we start talking globally. What do we do here? How do we make sure that we have a more sensible way of allocating these people. Now, I understand fully that the easier you make the route, more people will want it. And so there is a hesitancy yeah, about making the route clear. And, uh, you know, sometimes even, uh, you know, let, let them have to walk 40 days in the desert yeah. because maybe a few will, will die and that will, that will keep the others out. That's a terrible way of addressing the issue. 
And I think we need to think about it and, and not wish away the problem. We, we have, to these issues, we have an ostrich mentality. If we put our heads in the sand, maybe it goes away. It's not going to go away. It gets worse. And so let's start talking about it because we need a solution. Mm. Well, so let's uh, open up for questions on the floor. Please, gentlemen here. Is there, is there a microphone there? Okay, good, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, Luis Pereira da Silva from the, uh, the BIS. Uh, prof Professor Rajan, thank you very much for a very inspiring, truthful, and pragmatic uh, speech. I have just maybe two small questions. One is uh, a bit technical. On the beautiful mechanism that you designed, uh, for example, based on the average uh, greenhouse gas emissions per capita, would you consider including also preservation uh, of carbon capture, for example, in the equation? Because that might also count technically in the design of the uh, transfers of the uh, global fund. The second uh, question is, uh, I think we are all aware that uh, the uh, carbon budget that is left is limited. We have about, uh, if we believe, and I, I, and I do, on the uh, IPCC reports, it's about 350 gigatons uh, left. So it means that the reduction, the global reduction has to happen and time is absolutely of the essence. So how would you go about uh, in the mechanism that you have designed convincing uh, people that not only there is a need for funding quickly uh, this global public good with, let's say, the formula that uh, you are envisioning, but also that it has to be done quickly. This, there is an incentive for rapidity here and speed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take another question. Ted. Thank you very much, uh, Ted Truman. I can't see Raghu, but I, he's fine. <laughs> so I have a question about the first two phases of your trilogy, uh, uh, adaptation and uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and you might have in your studies, you may have thought about this question. And that is, to the extent that we, uh, things get worse, right, because mitigation is not being effective enough, right, we're going to turn to adaptation, right? And all of these things take resources. So what is the risk that we're going to divert our resources from mitigation to adaptation, which will, before we get to the migration, which I agree with you 100%, uh, 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 what is the risk that you see in this, in this uh, process of, of but move from one to the other? Thank you very much. Thank you. One more question? Um, hi, um, so my name is Afia and I'm affiliated with a youth organization called Global Voices from Australia. My question is about youth inclusion in the climate space. My home country of Australia is already starting to experience the adverse impacts of climate change where we have experienced bushfires and floods. While Australia is committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2050, I worry that is, this is too late, especially since Australia is so dependent on fossil fuels, including coal. So my question is, how can myself and other youth from my country better engage in this space of climate advocacy? Thank you. Do you want to take this first? Sure. First? Um, let me take them. Uh, Luis, thanks for the question. Um, absolutely. The, the scheme is very flexible. We can, for example, compute, uh, for sake of example, Brazil's excess forests. How much does it have excess relative to country, maybe at its per capita income? That's the preservation. And then think about how much carbon that those forests are consuming. That's the credit you get per capita of keeping those excess forests. That's one way of incorporating that. Similarly, some countries don't consume carbon. Uh, they're manufacturing, but they're manufacturing for the world. You can deduct the carbon that is exported if we focus only on consumption. So, I mean, there are things that can be done to modify the scheme for almost anything. We need to negotiate those uh, because the simple scheme, the problem is the more you negotiate and the more bells and whistles you put in, the more it complicates the scheme. The beauty of the scheme is if you can explain it to a 10 year old, uh, maybe a 15 year old. Um, uh, quickly, I don't know. 
I mean, I have been saying, well, I, I became a climate action convert by talking to people like Nick Stern. But, uh, but I, I, I do think, uh, and I'm so worried about the non-linearities that we have no idea uh, how, you know, the process sort of can, can accelerate. So I think we, you know, risk management, Jacob talked about in the banking seminar, we need to do it now. And I don't know other than just shouting from the rooftops, we need to do it and, and we need agreement. Um, and we need agreement, uh, one last point, while we have a US administration that still believes that climate change is a problem. Uh, and so I would say we need it before the next two years. Uh, it's already late. Um, uh, risk mitigation, and adaptation. I think, Ted, you have an excellent point. And, and I would argue that uh, one way to, to uh, uh, sort of pass this is we know that, uh, you know, uh, poorer countries, mitigation will become, uh, sorry, adaptation will become more of a problem more quickly. Richer countries uh, can still focus more on mitigation rather than adaptation. So maybe some kind of sliding scale may be warranted, uh, you know, Perhaps when we talk about carbon taxes, um, you know, a higher carbon tax for the industrial countries where mitigation becomes more important, perhaps lower carbon ta tax in the poorer countries where adaptation is the bigger issue. That, that might be one way to think about it. On Australia, look, I, I, I think it's, it's certainly an important issue. I wouldn't necessarily just blame Australia for producing the coal. There are coal consumers elsewhere that require that coal. I think we need an agreement. I think we need a global agreement. That's the way to go. And I think Australian youth, to the extent they can support that and find ways to push uh, their politicians to move faster on it, I think that'll be very beneficial. <clears throat> Couple of more questions. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you first of all for the lecture. It was extremely entertaining. My name is Alex and I'm a member of the Youth Diplomats of Canada. I had a question about uh, redistributive policies. Of course, we downsides of climate change. I'm sorry, the mic, somebody's yeah. shutting your mic off. Can you hear me? Yeah. Of Do you want to come up here? I'll repeat your question. Just, sure. Just say it. Yeah. Right. So the question is, uh, you know, climate change affects the marginalized most of all, uh, including youth. And globalization has also affected the marginalized, including youth. So other than saying we need to compensate the losers, what more should we do? Now, let me, let me just uh, qualify that a little bit. I, I'm not sure that globalization has hit youth uh, necessarily more than it has hit. Uh, youth have the benefit of being able to adapt. Uh, older workers have established sets of skills and it's much harder for them to adapt. The key issue is we have to do a much better job in allowing people to react flexibility to global change, fle flexibly to global change. Mm -hmm. That's something that the Scandinavian countries do very well. If you're in a job, they have people going in to ask you, what more courses do you need to take? Um, you know, if this job ends tomorrow, are you capable of taking another job? Where, what would you like to do? What courses do you need for that? That's the kind of dialogue we need to have to make people prepared for the volatility that glo global uh, sort of um, globalization will induce. It means we have to find a way for people out of agriculture. It means we have to find a way for people out of traditional manufacturing into new areas. But I think youth are, are well prepared if they have those opportunities. And that's why I'm saying the emphasis should be on opportunities. Okay. <clears throat> Question over there. Um, hello, thank you for the lecture. It was wonderful. I'm Chaitanya. I'm a Indian student at American University. Um, my question to you is, um, we've seen that both culture and politics have caused a lot of irrationality when it comes to economic decisions. And that, and that also flows into decisions related to climate change or migration. Is there a 
tipping point maybe where the cultural and political irrationality gives way to economic pragmatism or is it possible for countries to just keep their heads in the sand for as long as it takes even if it is causing them active losses as we see it happening in some countries today it's a great question i wish i knew the answer <laughs> uh i do think that um you know as as the reality becomes more obvious there will be public pressure to do something but you know we can go a long way without doing very much uh and look uh, i i i i think we are getting some momentum but as louis said it's too slow we need to go faster and yeah let's hope i'm crossing fingers yeah. last two questions Thank you. Congratulations on the lecture. I'm Gabriel Casillas at Barclays. Um, you partially answered this question, but I mean, you put together the globalization with the policy response, the slow policy response to climate change. But going to the deglobalization part, what do you think are like the main characteristics of why we are here? And in order to see how can we re-globalize the world? So uh, one of the things I didn't dwell on is the commonality. into why both climate change policies and globalization policies are difficult you know the benefits are more longer term more far out the costs are more immediate everybody knows what a carbon tax is i mean remember the gilets jaunes in france yeah you putting taxes on me you're worried about the end of the world i'm worried about the end of the month right so immediate costs longer term benefits beneficiary spread out the costs are borne immediately by a localized uh, vocal group that's true of globalization that's true of climate action and that's why i think politically it's harder to summon up uh, sort of reasons to do it i think climate is going to be easier because people will see the consequences they will see the hot days they will see the fires they will see the uh, floods but i i i i think as i said uh, therefore you will see globalization thrown under the bus that's not so important and and i think we need to make that case last point these are policies that have you know second round and third round effects that are positive the first round effect is always almost always negative right you will pay a carbon tax you will lose your job for a populist who speaks in one sentence sort of uh clear understandable sentences talking to the public much easier to make the first argument for the uh sensible pragmatic politician who's looking at the uh the the larger scheme of things much harder to make the rebuttal so i think in this era where we've lost trust in politicians it's harder for those longer term policies to be enacted because the populists will say why are you doing that why are you letting in immigrants it's hurting us no no i don't want to hear your talk about aging and the need to actually support our social security that's 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 far removed you're bringing in immigrants today so i i we need to i i think everybody in this in this hall is part of the intelligentsia we absolutely need to make the case much more clearly for all these thank you thank you <clears throat> last question All right. Uh thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, my name is Dale Vasquez. I'm from the Young Diplomats of Canada. Um and my question is concerning uh your claims towards service liberalization. So multilateral organizations have a strategic role to play um in standardizing the skill requirements and capacitation strategies um for the jobs of the future. Because if these priorities are left to nation states, um well states however you want to typify them, then these states were are going to continue to perpetuate brain waste. And so my question for you is how can we reconcile this um your claim to subsidiarity um with this necessity for a multilateral approach Yeah uh, great question and and you basically saying do we need a global approach here yeah. or can we be local And I'm saying probably do a little bit of both have a global test but if you think your country is different have a local equivalence equivalence exam because there are special conditions it allows you to have a little bit of control but also not put up unnecessary barriers but we can work towards that this is at this point if i say let's have a global test on you know medical test it's laughable 
but how different are the medical ailments in Africa from the U.S.? You know, maybe you have more diseases of, of old age in the U.S. Than, uh, than you have in Africa, but Africa is getting there. So I think this is a dialogue we have to have. And it's important we see the necessity of that dialogue. That's why I put migration as the third element, because there's this belief somehow we will stay immune from what happens in the rest of the world. We will not. And let's start working on what we need to now. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> this ends um, the lecture of uh, Ragu today. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for being here. We're right on time. Uh, so let's give a round of applause to Ragu. <laughs>